Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So today we continue with Surah Ali Imran verses 26 onwards where Allah says, Say, O Allah, owner of sovereignty, you give sovereignty to whom you will, you take sovereignty away from whom you will, you honor whom you will, you humble whom you will, in your hands is all good, indeed you are over all things competent. Now in this verse, um, Allah is addressing really the, the hypocrites because one of the things that the hypocrites did in Medina was after Muhammad peace upon him came, uh, they were terrified of um, you know, completely submitting to the will of Allah because they had this fear that you know, the Muslims are now here and they have made and uh, Muhammad peace be upon him has become the head of state. But the Jews in Medina are still a very powerful and a very wealthy uh, a group or a wealthy community. If we go against the Jews, and if we were to give our, um, you know, our honest, if we were to submit completely to Allah and follow Muhammad peace be upon him, the Jews might go against us. And in the future, if the Muslims were to lose and the Jews were to gain power, then they will go against us. Mm -hmm. So while being Muslims, they would secretly make a pact with the Jews to make the Jews know that, listen, we are still on your side. We are still your friends. We still value your friendship. So the idea being that in case the Jews win in the future, we can always go running back to the Jews. And if the Muslims win in the future and the Muslims keep expanding, we can always tell the Muslims, well, you know, we're, we're part of the Ummah, we are your Muslim brothers. Mm -hmm. So Allah was reminding them that sovereignty and power does not lie with the Jews. Power, wealth, honor, all of this only lies with Allah. And Allah is saying that he uh, has sovereignty, he will give it to whom he wills, and he will take it from whom he wills. Honor is also in his hands. He gives it to whom he wills. And he can take it and he can humble. Take away that from whom he wills. Indeed, uh, over all things, Allah is competent. So when Allah gives you power or honor, then that is a blessing or is that a test? What do you think? It's a test. Why? Because when you get a lot of um, you know a lot of praise and a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of honor, become self righteous. Right, but if you, Allah gives you power, so He gives you money, and and uh, all of these things, if you do not become self righteous, you just have been given a lot of money, and you be, you've been given a lot of uh, power and sovereignty and honor, status, promotion, all of these things. Mm -hmm. If I don't become self righteous, why is it a test? Because eventually you'll become greedy for this dunya. Maybe I won't become greedy then. Then uh, maybe it's a test to see will you, uh, you know, become, uh, uh, will you start thinking that I achieved all of this by myself? So in other words, what you're saying is that it's a test because the question Allah will ask you is that after being given everything, did you use it in the cause of Allah or did you use it to get closer to dunya? That is how it actually becomes a test. So if Allah gives you more wealth and he gives you more blessings, how did you use them? If you use them to get closer to Allah, then it becomes a blessing for you. It becomes, there is khair in it for you. If you use it to get, to fall in love with dunya even more and move even more, uh, even more away from Islam, then it becomes something which is not good for you. So it, at that moment, it is not a blessing for you. And so every time you are given power, honor, wealth, it is not a blessing unless and until you start using it in the cause of Allah. Right? Mm -hmm. It is a test to see how will you use it. And this is what Allah is explaining over here to the munafiqeen. That when it comes to the Jews, they are given power and honor, not because Allah loves them or Allah is happy with them, but it's because it is a test for them. And if they are going to use all of that to go against Muhammad, peace be upon him, then Allah will eventually take all that power and honor away from them. And he is going to destroy them in both this world as well as the next. Okay. So then Allah says, you cause the night to enter the day, you cause the day to enter the night, and you bring the living out of the dead, you bring the dead out of the living. And you, you give provision to whom you will without any account. Let not believers take disbelievers as their friends rather than believers. And whoever of you does that has nothing with Allah, except when taking precaution against them in, in prudence. And Allah warns you of himself and to Allah is the final destination. 
So as you see over here in verse 200, uh, sorry, in verse 28, Allah is making clear that do not make friends with them. Do not make friends with the disbelievers. That includes the polytheists, the Jews, the Christians, all those who are non-Muslims. And Allah is saying, if you do that, then you have nothing to do with Allah. So Allah is now disassociating himself with you. He's not considering you as even being a Muslim. Now, that does that mean we cannot be friends with non-believers? Yes. So it's not even good to like talk to them and be friends with them and go out with them. All of that is wrong. But it says in the uh, no, um, uh, you can be friends with them as long as you are uh, careful about you know not breaking the rules of Islam. No, what this is saying is <clears throat> you can be friends with them. Okay, you can be friends with them. You can actually uh, uh, spend spend time with them as well because how else are you going to spread the message of Islam? Mm. What this is saying is do not seek advice from them. In other words, if you want information, sincere advice regarding how you should do something, whether it is personal uh, you know, advice uh, regarding your family and friends, whether it's about the overall economy, um, regardless of what kind of advice it is, do not seek it from the non-believers because they don't believe in Allah. So they cannot give you an answer that is consistent with the Quran and the Sunnah because they don't believe in the Quran and they don't believe in Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And because they are uh, on the inside, they don't have that sincerity towards you. It is most likely they will give you advice that is going to be harmful to you or that is going to be harmful for your faith and your Iman. That's why you can be friends with them. You can socialize uh, if you want with them. You can go out with them. But when it comes to seeking advice and um, you know doing something which will affect your lifestyle or you know when it comes to making important decisions, then go to the Muslims, go to the believers. And what you see uh, in the Quran as well that when Allah talks about believers too, He will tell the Muslims that when you want to seek advice, even inside the believers it's not that you just go to any muslim who should you abstain from um oh no you should abstain from the hypocrites the hypocrites because no, even but how would you know who the hypocrites right so then of course in uh, as we explained in the beginning of surah bakara at times there are people where it becomes uh, absolutely clear that the things they are spreading all right, the kind of information they are spreading about Islam is wrong. And so it becomes clear that they are spreading fasad. Like you'll see in the beginning of Surah Baqarah, Allah says that when you tell them, do not spread fasad, they end up saying that we are the ones who are doing things right. So there are sometimes uh, uh, people, there are munafiks, when they reach the extreme of munafqat, they start to do things that are clearly and publicly, visibly so wrong that they twist the version of Islam. So then don't go to them and seek advice. Don't go to them and ask them because it's very likely they will give you some advice which is not according to the Quran and Sunnah. All right. So this is what the Muslims are being um, advised over here. And then Allah says, say whether you conceal what is in your chest or whether you reveal it, Allah knows it. And he knows that which is in the heavens and that which is on the earth. And Allah is over all things competent. The day every soul will find what it has done of good and what it has done of evil. It will wish that between itself and evil was a great distance. And Allah warns you of himself. Allah is kind to his servants. Um, by the way, before we move on, in verse 27, Allah talked about causing the day to enter the night and the night to enter the day. That's, of course, the fact that Allah is so powerful, he can, he can alternate day and night. To bring the living out of the dead and the dead out of the living. The living out of the dead. How does Obviously Allah need to bring uh, the things that are dead back to life? How does Allah bring um, the living out of the dead? So something is dead, and Allah brings the living out of it. And how do you think Allah brings the dead out of the living? Uh, the first one might be a, a hint to day of judgment, you know. Okay, maybe, Because yeah. if you die and then a, a, your ruh is taken out, so it's like taking uh, something that's alive or out of something that's dead, oh, kind of. Okay, okay. Because the body's dead. Okay, yeah. Uh, the second one was what? To, to bring the dead out of the living. To bring the dead out of the living. That mm. basically means to give death, right? To bring the dead out, out of the living. 
So if someone, no, uh, something is the... living and to bring the dead out of it. So in other words, that thing has been given death. So it was living and now it has, now it has died. And to bring the living out of the dead could mean what you're saying. Like, for instance, when a person dies, the ru, which is living, is taken out, is taken out of something which is uh, dead. But it could also mean like, um, you know, when you tend to look at the signs of Allah around you, when you look at the seed, the seed is dead. A seed is not living, right? Because if you put it on a sofa or on a table, it's just dead. There's no growth or anything. But the minute you put it in soil and give it sunlight and water, what comes out of it? Right. Which is living. Right? Mm -hmm. So these are just examples of Allah's might and power as well. Mm -hmm. And so here, um, as I was saying in verse 29 and 30, Allah is telling now the Muslims that if you are doing something like this, where you are secretly... Uh, making ties with the people Allah keeps warning you do not make ties with them then Allah is saying whatever it is that you secretly are thinking or doing in your heart or whatever uh, uh, acts that you're performing secretly Allah knows all of it even your fears your doubts that you might be having everything is something Allah says I'm perfectly aware of and it will be made clear to you on the day of judgment and then Allah says uh, that day of course on the Day of Judgment, everyone will know what uh, good uh, deeds they performed in this life. That will be made clear and all the evil they did will also be made clear. So they get to see their entire life flash right in front of their eyes on the Day of Judgment. Everything will be shown to them. So it becomes clear. Yeah. Oh, so I have one question. Um, so will the Christians and basically all the non-believers Will they have any good deeds because they don't believe in Allah? Well, what you see uh, in the Quran, Allah explains that if you did good deeds, but you did not do them purely for the sake of Allah. So in other words, you didn't actually believe really in God, then all of those deeds will not be included. Right. So the non-believers will have a zero good deeds? Yeah. Because whatever good deeds you did, you, you weren't doing it for God. You were doing it for yourself. You were doing it uh, for some other God. You know, you might have been doing it for Jesus Christ, right? So whatever it is that you were doing, it was not purely for the sake of God. If it was purely for Allah, then of course you would have embraced Islam because that is what Islam is about, submit to the will of Allah. So your deeds will not be accepted. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is why Allah says on the day of judgment, when people are shown their good deeds and then they're shown the evil that they did they will wish that the distance between them and their evil was huge so another and can you understand what that means yeah what i mean i know what it means i don't know how to explain it basically that uh they would wish that they would stay away from all the evil things that they did kind of yeah but it's a, it's a day of judgment so you cannot stay away from it now right yeah and you cannot go back so what does it mean when they're saying that they would wish that, that the distance between them and the evil was huge? Them and the evil. Yeah. Mm. You know, when you... Oh, uh, oh, what are you trying to say? Them and the, uh, the evil, uh, between them and the people who are like... No, 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 no. no. Okay. What this means is when you are shown uh, the evil deeds that you committed, you will be so humiliated and so ashamed of yourself that you will wish that all those evil deeds were just so far away from you. You know, it's, it's an expression. So, you know, in terms of dunya, when sometimes something really embarrassing happens to you, so we say, oh, I just wish that I would just die right now. Or I just wish that the earth would split and I would just go deep down into the ground. Right? So that, in other words, I just wish nobody could see me right now and I could not see anybody because I'm so embarrassed. I'm so humiliated. Right? The, mm -hmm. So uh, basically the individual wants to just run away and not have to face anyone. That's, ba that's really an expression. This is what Allah is saying over here, that the person will be so humiliated at that time that they will say, I wish the distance between me and my evil deeds that now can be visible to everyone on the day of judgment. And especially to me myself, I wish my distance was so far away I could just hide somewhere. You get it? This is what Allah is saying. That's why He says, when you do evil deeds, be very careful because your life will be flushed in front of everyone and in front of you on the day of judgment. So it's going to be a day when everyone will know 
that yes, Allah has done extreme justice because just look at the kind of things this person did. You know, how can he possibly go to Jannah? He did such evil deeds, such wrong deeds, and he did it while he was knowing it was wrong. Right? So that, that's really what the expression is. So then Allah says, Say, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, if you should love Allah, then follow me. So Allah will love you and forgive you of your sins and Allah is forgiving and merciful. So obey Allah and the messenger. But if they turn away, indeed, Allah does not like the disbelievers. So if you really do love Allah, what should you do? Uh, or follow the Prophet. That's why it's, he's called a Rasul, remember? Not a Nabi. Do you remember the difference? He is a Nabi, but beyond he's beyond a Nabi in the sense that he has a higher status. He is a Rasul. Mm -hmm. And I told you that whenever a Rasul is sent, he has a Sharia, he has a Sunnah. And the Rasul always says, follow me. Every single thing that I'm doing, follow it because I am here to teach you the laws. I'm here to teach you how to worship Allah. A Nabi does not say, follow me. A Nabi says, follow the Rasul that came before me, follow the Sunnah and follow the Sharia that that Rasul had already brought. But the Nabi does not say, everyone, follow me. Right? He simply tells them to follow the Rasul that came before and he reminds them that you all have to worship one God. Right? But Allah is saying, this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not just a Nabi, he is a Rasul. I sent him for a purpose, obey him, follow him. Because if you obey him and follow him, then you are actually following me. Therefore, if you really do love me, then you got to follow this man. And again, why was this important? Because the Munafiks, some of them uh, would actually state that, listen, we love God. We have no issues with Allah. We have no issues with the Quran. We have no issues, um, you know, praying and fasting and performing all of the, the main rituals. Our issue is we are not going to blindly follow this man because he's just a human. He's just a man. So if he tells us to do something, why should we listen? If it comes in the Quran, then we'll do it. You get it? Mm -hmm. Precisely what the previous Ummah would, would often do. They would say, okay, we're okay worshipping Allah, but you know, this man, this uh, you know, Musa salam, or any of these prophets, they're just prophets, they're humans. They can make uh, mistakes just like us. They can commit the same kind of sins. So this is what Allah keeps repeating to the munafiks and for us as well, that whatever you see of the sunnah and the authentic hadith, you don't ignore it, you follow it. Because the more you try and follow the Prophet, the more you are actually following God. And then Allah will love you. Uh, you said that the munafiks, some munafiks at that time, would say that, uh, that, that if it is inside the Quran, uh, then we will believe. Yeah. So when this... Uh, was it revealed did they believe because this is not part of the Quran right? it is but th again the, the idea was that when it comes to monophics who don't want to follow the Prophet it's not that there was no evidence that that was provided to them that they should follow Muhammad peace be upon him it's just that they didn't want to so when you don't when you believe in your heart and you have convinced yourself that I am not going to do this then no matter how many verses I give you or how much justification I give you you just won't do it Right. So in the same way, they had decided that regardless of what this man says or anyone says, we will not do it. Even when these verses came, those who ha who were adamant that we are not going to follow this man blindly, they would not agree to the verse and they would continue on believing what they were believing initially. Right. They would come up with their own arguments that how do we know this verse is from God? How do we know that he's not making it up? You know, so on, so forth. You understand? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the problems of the Munafiqeen. And you'll see that in the Quran as well, that, for instance, whenever the Prophet had to talk about battles and wars, right, the, the hypocrites didn't like it. So they would come up with their own version that, no, this is not Allah, this is not coming from God, this is Him. You get it? Because even though Allah talks about so many verses regarding jihad, because they just didn't want to do it, they would start believing or at least giving this false statement that no, this is not from the Quran, this, this man is coming, he's, he's making it up. So then Allah says in verse 33 and 34, Indeed, Allah chose Adam and Nu and the family of Ibrahim and the family of Imran over the world's descendants, some of them from others, and Allah's hearing and knowing. Now, from here onwards, uh, for the next 30, 40 verses, it's going to be um, this entire 
a speech or sermon that was given by Muhammad peace be upon him to a group, to a delegation of Christians who had come from Najran. Najran is a place, okay, at that time it was a place that was believed to be in Yemen. And uh, the reason why this Christian delegation came all the way to see Muhammad peace be upon him is that, again, it's believed these verses were revealed towards the end of um, the, the Prophet's life, somewhere around 10 years after Hijrat, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, in other words, 10 years after the, uh, the Prophet had migrated to Medina. And by this time, since it was quite late, in, this is the late Madani period, by this time the Prophet, peace be upon him, had started to send letters to all kinds of people outside of Arabia, giving them this, um, this information that Islam has come. So you have three options. Number one, you can embrace Islam. Okay. Number two, if you do not wish to embrace Islam, you can pay us jizya. In other words, we will eventually take, take over because we have to build an Islamic empire. We have to spread the message of truth to every corner of the world so that nobody can die and say, Allah, I'm sorry, you sent a prophet. I had no idea. I never heard the message of Islam. So we have to spread Islam as much as we can. An empire has to be built. So they were told, number one, embrace Islam. Number two, if you don't wish to, then that's okay. There, we will not compel you to, but we will eventually take over your land. So pay jizya to us. Okay? Jizya is like a tax. Mm -hmm. And paying jizya meant that if you pay money to the Muslim army as jizya, now the Muslim, the Islamic State, has to grant you protection against any, for, any kind of attack. Mm -hmm. So if there's any enemy that attacks you, the Muslim army will have to intervene and they will have to grant you protection. And since you're using the, the resources of the Muslim army and the Muslim state, you have to pay them something. So that's why they, they were told, okay, fine. Since you, are, you will come under the Islamic empire, then pay us jizya. And if you say we will not accept Islam and we will not pay jizya, then be prepared for oh. battle. Then be prepared for war. We are going to take over your land and take over everything then. Okay, so the first option is embrace Islam. The second option is you can continue doing what mm -hmm. you're doing. Yeah, go ahead. We won't intervene. Just pay us jizya. Third option is, okay, fine. Uh, we'll, we'll simply have a war and we'll take over. Now, the Christian delegation, the Christians in uh, Najran, they had received this letter. So their governor sent um, uh, a Christian delegation that go to this man who claims to be a prophet and uh, just hear what he has to say about this Islam, okay? And then come back and tell us so we can decide is, this, is he even a prophet or not and so on. So when the delegation came to Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, Muhammad, peace be upon him, knows this is a delegation. These people are Christians because they introduced themselves as Christians. So since he knew that they are from Najran and they are Christians, he decided, okay, I have to give them a speech now because they, they're asking me, that tell us, uh, tell us something about Islam, mm -hmm. because we, we have to go back, we have to tell our governor, so we want to know, are you a prophet or not? And now he, could, he has to tell them about Islam, so he could tell them anything. There are so many things he could talk about, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think he, he decides to talk about? Um, uh, you know, the ancestors, basically the prophet that the Christians really look up to. Like? But he said Islam. Okay, so... He starts to talk about the area of commonality between Muslim and Christians. The area where both of them agree. So he's talking about Adam alayhi salam, the first man, of course. Nuh alayhi salam, all right, they of course agree to that. Ibrahim alayhi salam, right, of course, he's the father of, of the nations. Um, then it talks about the family of Imran. Now it's believed that Imran Many of the tafsir believe Imran is talking about um, possibly the father of Musa alayhi salam. So in other words, the family of Imran means we're talking about Musa alayhi salam, Harun alayhi salam, and all of their descendants. So that incorporates Musa and Harun. Is that why it's called Ali Imran? That could be a reason why it's called, yes, the family of Imran, Ali Imran. So from this what we understand is that um, now the prophet is talking about areas of commonality so these people are are waiting to see okay what does this man speak about islam 
And the first thing he mentions are prophets, which they already believe in and they have a lot, a lot of respect for. And then beyond this, he's going to focus specifically on that group of people that the Christians have a lot of respect for, which includes Zakaria alayhi salam, which includes Yahya alayhi salam, which includes Maryam alayhi salam, and finally Isa alayhi salam. And this, and now of course, what is the biggest bone of contention between Muslims and Christians? Oh, what is bone of contention? I mean, bone difference? of contention, yes. That they believe Isa is the son of God. And they Biggest were... bone of contention is Isa is they believe, is the son of God and he was crucified. We believe he was never crucified and he's not the son of God, he's just a prophet, right? So we believe the exact opposite of what they believe. Well, not the exact opposite. We do believe that he's a prophet. We believe he's a very honorable uh, uh, messenger. We believe he's a promised Messiah, but we do not believe that he's divine <clears throat> or that he's the son of God. So, um, Muhammad, peace be upon him, knowing that these are Christians who have come, he could have started off with this statement, the simple mm -hmm. statement that Isa salam was this and he is not this, right? But by saying that... Uh, but he starts with the area of commonality, right? Why do you think he does that? To soften their hearts. To soften their hearts. Whenever you are giving tabligh and you are talking to someone, First of all, understand your audience. You don't just go open your mouth and talk about Islam. Because by doing that, you might actually do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Allah will question you not just, uh, did you talk about Islam? More than that, Allah will ask you, how did you talk about Islam? How did you preach? When Allah gives you knowledge and wisdom, then you don't just go around and, and, and talk about Islam as you wish. You have to talk about Islam with a lot with that wisdom Allah has given you mm -hmm. so understand your audience understand um, the kind of things that they like the kind of things that they don't like so start off with areas of commonality so their heart will soften when you talk to someone uh, and you start your discussion with the area of difference then their defense mechanism becomes active in other words their body is now ready to fight or flight it's either fight or they'll just get up and simply walk away. But when you start off with the area of commonality, their heart softens, and then gradually move to the area of difference. Because if you do it that way, then their heart by that time has become so soft that it will absorb exactly everything that you're saying. Okay, if they accept it or not, that is different. But the heart will testify, it will absorb it. Okay, so, um, over here now, um, Muhammad peace be upon him is talking about all these very important prophets and the family of Imran. And as this is going on, he then says, mention O Muhammad peace be upon him when the wife of Imran said, now over here it says wife of Imran. Again, some scholars say maybe uh, Maryam salam's father was also called Imran. And some scholars say the wife of Imran means that basically Maryam salam's mother was a woman of the household of Imran. So in other words, she was also a descendant of Imran. So Musa salam's father, if you go all the way down his family tree, if you go down all the way, you know, examine all of his descendants, then you will, um, what will be included is not just Musa salam and Harun salam, but eventually Maryam salam's mother as well, and therefore Maryam salam and of course Isa salam. Okay, so this is something uh, the scholars are saying. This could mean that Maryam salam's father was also called Imran, or this could mean that Allah is saying that Maryam salam's mother was a woman of Imran's family. And that's, that's an expression of saying the wife of Imran or the woman of Imran, so that she was also from that same uh, family tree. The wife of, uh, of Imran... Be it's, it's an expression, right? So it could be an expression or it could be that she, that so, her husband she was the wife of Imran. Or it could be that her husband was called Imran. Again, we don't know. But the reason why, um, you know, Allah has not specifically mentioned is because it's not important. Mm. It, it mm. really doesn't matter who her husband was. And so Allah is saying over here that um, when the wife of, of Imran said, My Lord, indeed, I have pledged to you what is in my womb. Uh, and I have uh, consecrated it for your service. So accept this from me. Indeed, you are hearing and knowing. 
But when she delivered, so in other words, when she gave birth, she said, Oh my Lord, I have delivered a female. And Allah was most knowing of what she had delivered. And the male is not like the female. And I have named her Mary or Maryam. And I seek refuge for her in you and for her descendants from shaitan, the expelled from the mercy of Allah. So she is the mother of Maryam. Yes, she is the mother of Maryam alayhi salam. And when um, Maryam alayhi salam's mother, when she was pregnant, she decided, she prayed to Allah and she said that, you know, um, uh, this baby that I'm going to have, I want to dedicate this baby to the service of Islam. Now, at that time, Solomon's temple or Suleiman alayhi salam's masjid, that was there. It had been built. This, uh, do you remember the first time it was built? Then it was destroyed by the Babylonian yeah. king, whose name is? Uh, Nabakh Nazar. Yes. And then after that, the Jews became captives in Babylonia. And then subsequently, they were allowed to re-enter, come back to their land. Mm -hmm. And when they came back, they were able to rebuild Solomon's temple. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when this story is taking place, Solomon's temple has been rebuilt. Okay. And um, so at this time, what happened was what many people would do is, if they wanted to dedicate their children to the service of Islam, they would send their boys, only boys were, were allowed. They would send their boys to live in Solomon's temple. And over there, they would have like a, a priest or an imam who would teach the children about Torah and then they would live there. So they would live in the Solomon's temple. They would be groomed and trained in matters of deen. They, they would be taught the entire Torah so that as they, when they grow older, they could become like an imam and they could spread Islam. Right. But this was not something that girls were allowed to do. Only boys. You could only send your sons because all the boys would live together in the Solomon's temple and they would be raised over there. Mm. So Maryam alayhi salam's mother had this, you know, she had this wish that Allah, um, you know, when I have this baby, I would like to dedicate this baby to your service because she was hoping and she was expecting that perhaps it will be a son. Mm -hmm. But when a daughter, was, when she gave birth to a daughter, she said, oh Allah, I've given birth to a female. In other words, now I cannot do this. I cannot send her to Solomon's temple, right? So she ends up saying, Allah, I have named her Mary and I seek refuge for her in you and for her descendants from shaitan. So Allah, please guide her and please protect her and her descendants from shaitan. But interestingly, Allah says over here, and the male is not like the female. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this could actually mean two things. Of course, this could mean that, yes, um, she had given birth to a daughter and the daughter is not like a son. So the daughter would, you know, it will not be permitted for her to go to Solomon's temple. It could be talking about that or it could be talking about the fact that Allah is saying, yes, a female is not like a male because a female can give birth. So it was perhaps an indication that uh, you have given birth to a female. This female is later on going to give birth to the actual Messiah, to an amazing prophet, to an amazing messenger. Right. So there was wisdom in Allah giving this woman a daughter instead of a son. It could mean that, too. But in any case, um, this is uh, uh, what Maryam al-Islam's mother wanted. So when the daughter was born, she was a little bit shocked for this reason. But it's not because she said, oh, um, I, I, I never wanted a daughter. Daughters are a burden. Daughters are a problem. Because unfortunately, some people quote this verse and say, see, this is the reason why daughters are an issue. Uh, sons are better. She's not disappointed that she had a daughter because she doesn't like daughters. She was, a, and she was in a bit of a shock because she wanted a son who she could dedicate to Solomon's temple mm -hmm. so that that person, that child could become an imam. Mm -hmm. But then this is what Allah did. Allah says, so her Lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner and put her in the care of Zakaria. And every time Zakaria ent entered upon her in the prayer chamber, he found uh, with her provision. And he said, oh, Maryam, from where is all of this coming to you? And she said, it's coming from Allah. Allah provides from whom he wills without account. And at that, Zakaria called upon his Lord saying, Allah grant me from yourself a good uh, good offspring indeed you are the hero of supplication so the angels ca called him while he was standing in prayer in the chamber and the angel said indeed Allah gives you good tidings of John uh, this the English name is John and otherwise it's Yahya confirming a word from Allah and who will be honorable abstaining and a prophet from amongst the righteous 
So the interesting thing is that while Maryam al Islam's mother was a bit uh, sort of in a shock, a, a bit of a disappointment that this is a daughter and I cannot send this daughter to the Solomon's temple, what subsequently happened was that as that uh, baby girl, as she grew older, um, Maryam al Islam's mother, she made a request to uh, Zakaria al Islam. Now, Zakaria al Islam was the tutor of. No, no. Zakaria al Islam was already a prophet, and he was the uncle of Maryam al Islam. So it's believed that uh, Maryam al Islam's mother, mm. if you look at her, and she's believed to be called Hannah. Okay, mm. her sister's husband was Zakaria al Islam. Okay, her sister's husband was believed to be Zakaria al Islam. So Zakaria is Maryam's uncle. So Maryam al Islam's mother, she made a request to Zakaria that this is, you know, something that I wanted to do with my child, but this is a daughter now. So is there any possibility? And Zakaria al Islam, he decided that yes, uh, we will take her, and we will teach her about Deen, even though it was not uh, something that was done during that time. It was only for the sons. Now, because this is a girl, and the girl cannot live with the boys in the Solomon's temple, Zakaria Lesalam built a small chamber, a private chamber, right next to Solomon's temple, mm -hmm. and that is where Maryam Lesalam would then live, and she would be groomed and trained in matters of Deen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what this verse is explaining is that every time Zakaria Lesalam would come into the private chamber in order to talk to her and teach her about Deen. He would, he would always find that there was a lot of provisions with her. Now, provision could mean there was always ample food and drink available. And it can also mean she had a lot of knowledge and wisdom. So Zakaria Salam would ask her, where is this coming from? Okay, It could be, again, the knowledge and the wisdom as well as this food and drink. And she would say, well, it comes to me from Allah. Allah provides from whom he wills. And when Zakaria Salam saw that, he understood that, okay, this is amazing. This girl is special. So uh, by this time, Zakaria al -Salam is a very, very old man. And his wife is also very, very old. So he went back and he prayed to Allah. And he said, Allah, I wish that I could have, that you could grant me a very good and a righteous child of my own as well. You know, somebody who I could train and I could groom so that he could become a prophet and he could spread Islam. Mm. And so while he's standing and while he's doing uh, his prayers, uh, Allah says, uh, angels were sent to him while he was standing in prayer. And the angels told him that we are giving you uh, these this great news that Allah is going to bless you with a son whose name is Yahya. And he's going to be a prophet and he's going to be incredibly righteous. So where does Isa al Islam come? Isa al Islam is Maryam al Islam. No, this is going to come towards the end. In the story, Ajah. See, now this is the, the beautiful thing. Right now, as the prophet is speaking, the Christians from Najran are listening. They know the story. They know about Maryam. They know about Zakaria. They know about Yahya Salam. And they have a lot of respect for these figures. You understand? So now when Muhammad peace upon him is giving the same story and the same level of respect, it is softening their hearts. Mm -hmm. Right? And then it says over here in verse 40, he said, My Lord, in other words, Zakaria Salam said, My Lord, how will I have a boy? When I have become so old, my wife is barren. Barren meaning that when the wife has become so old, she can now no longer have a baby. So how mm -hmm. is this going to happen? And the angel said, such is Allah, he does exactly what he wills. So when Allah has decided it will be done, it will be done. And then in verse 41 it says, he said, my Lord, make for me a sign. So Allah said, your sign is that you will not be able to speak to people for three days except by gesture, by, by using your hands. Uh, you know, sign language. And remember your Lord much and exalt him in the evening and the morning. So this is a very interesting part because Zakaria salam said, okay, so according to what Allah is saying, my wife is going to get pregnant and she's going to give birth to a beautiful son and that son is going to be a prophet. But my wife is so old and she's barren. So this is going to be a sign from God that this is going to be a, a, a huge miracle, right? So, so Zakaria salam was asking Allah, how do I know when she's become pregnant? Because this is going to be uh, something that has never happened before. This is a miracle. So how do I know? Can you give me a sign? And Allah said, the sign is going to be that uh, you will find out on one day that you are not able to speak. 
And for three days, it's going to go on like this. And you will only be able to speak using um, you know, sign your language. gestures and sign language. And when that happens, you will know that the, uh, the beautiful miracle has now taken place and your wife has conceived. And uh, this is exactly what did happen. And Allah is saying, when that happens, exalt, praise, glorify Allah in the morning and the evenings. Tell people to do so as well, because right now a huge miracle has taken place. Now, this is really important because in the Bible, it says that uh, Zakaria was not able to speak for three days, right? And it says that he was not able to do this as a punishment from God. Because when God gave him the good news that you will have a son, he said, uh, he said over here that Allah, how is this possible? My wife is so old, right? Mm -hmm. So because he questioned God, God got angry and he said, okay, as a punishment, you, you won't be able to speak. And Allah is now clarifying here that Zakaria asked for a sign that how will I know? And, and uh, uh, Allah responded by saying, this is going to be your sign. It was not a punishment. And the beautiful thing is Allah is making it clear it's not a punishment because prophets are human beings. At times when they are given um, some kind of news which is, which is a, a miracle for them or when they are shown a miracle, they do go in shock. Right? Do you remember a prophet previously that we, we read about who saw something and who was shocked? Uh -huh. Yeah, who was that? Who was shocked. And he said something. What did he say? <laughs> he said he something say? that revealed that, you know, he was like, okay, Allah, how is this going to happen? How is what? Am what I did well? he say? If I tell you exactly, then I might as well as tell the whole story. I uh, know, uh, like one hint of what he said. How is God going to <laughs> revive this oh, oh, town? Oh, town. Okay. Oh, see, there you go. <laughs> when, the, when the plague came out and, and all of the people died. What? No. Husband. Oh, 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 when, when, uh, when, when, uh, when uh, Jerusalem was attacked by the baby yes. Lord, the king. Yes, Hazrat Uzair. When he Uzair came and he saw that the enti entire town had been demolished, he said, how is Allah going to give life to this place again? Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Uh, he died. Uh, he was put to... He was given death. Death, okay. For how many years? 400. 400 years? F 40? I said four. F-O-R, four. For how long? Oh, 40. Uh, 400. <laughs> for 100 years, mm -hmm. he was given death. And when he was raised, the donkey was all bones, but the food was still there. Now, did Allah punish him? No. No, Allah just did this to him to show him that you that Allah can do anything and everything, right? Mm -hmm. So as um, uh, as human beings, prophets, of course, they do sometimes go into shock. You will see this a similar kind of response that was given to Ibrahim alayhi mm -hmm. And you will see that as well. So, you know, this is actually very common, prophets, because at the end, at the end of the day, they believe in Allah, but they are human beings. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a natural reaction that they suddenly go, how? How is this going to happen? That doesn't mean they actually don't believe, but it's just a normal reaction. So he was not being punished. Mm -hmm. So Allah says, and mentioned when the angel said, Oh, Maryam, indeed, Allah has chosen you, purified you, and chosen you above the women of the worlds. And O oh, Maryam, be devoutly obedient to your Lord, prostrate, bow with those who bow down in prayer. So here's something very important now that is being said. First of all, uh, Maryam has been chosen um, to be above the women of the world. So a huge amount of respect for her. Again, the Christians who are listening, they are, they are agreeing. Yes, you know, this man is saying beautiful things about uh, Hazrat Maryam, about Mary. But then he mentions one thing. That Allah said, Maryam, be devoutly obedient to Allah and prostrate, do sajda, and bow with those who bow in prayer. Now, this was one slight bone of contention for the Christians who were listening. Because uh, what actually happened is that approximately in 325 AD, so approximately four in the 4th century, mm -hmm. okay, um, the, the Christians or the Pope, the Catholic Church, they came up with this concept of trinity. Okay, that you have God, then you have Jesus, who is the Son of God, and then you have the third one, which is the Holy Ghost, right? Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Um, 
they call it the Holy Ghost, in other words, Jibreel alayhi salam. So basically they say that this is one in three, three in one. Okay, this was the concept of Trinity, which is very confusing. But they came up with this idea that God is basically God, but then he is also the son of God. He is also Jesus and he is also in the form of the Holy Ghost. Okay, but initially what happened was um, their concept of Trinity, their concept of one in three, three in one was not God, Jesus and the Holy Ghost. It was God, Jesus and Mary. So it was believed that Maryam is the mother of God because if Jesus is the son of God and Jesus is Maryam son, then Maryam must be the mother of God. right? So they came up with this idea and they said Maryam is in fact divine. She's not just a human, she's in fact divine. Because you see, when you say that Jesus is a son of God, okay, and you're saying Jesus is divine, but Maryam is Jesus' mother. Uh -huh. So how could a human have given birth to something which is divine? So then they said, oh, well, because Maryam is divine too. Right? So now they came up with this new idea. This is initially one in three, three in one was God, Jesus and Mary, all three being divine. And uh, in specific, it was called uh, Theotokos. Theotokos meant that Maryam salam, is the mother of God. Then subsequently, later on, they changed it to being Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, But at that time, so approximately this is 4th, 5th century, they came up with the idea that Maryam is the mother of God. And even when Muhammad, peace be upon him, was there in Arabia, this thing was very common, that Mary is the mother of God. So uh, in the Byzantine Empire, so you remember when the Muslims were there, you had a Persian Empire and you had a Byzantine Empire. The emperor of, of the Byzantinians was known as uh, Emperor Heraclius. And Emperor Heraclius was a Christian and every time his army would go and they would fight battles, they would hold a flag and on the, fla and on the flag was a picture of a woman and they believed that this is the picture of Mary. So Mary is the mother of God and we are holding this flag because she's going to watch over us and because of her we will be able to win this battle. So even during the Prophet's time, it was common that Mary is in fact the mother of God and it, the one in three, three in one includes Maryam salam. Okay, it was centuries later that they changed it. So here, this is one first bone of contention that the Prophet has very subtly, he has mentioned that Maryam was told to be obedient to God, so she's not God. And to, she was told to prostrate, to do sajda, to bow down with everyone else who bows down. So she was told to submit her will to God. So if she's being told to submit her will, then she cannot possibly be God herself. Mm -hmm. And she cannot be the mother of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing. And then it says over here uh, in verse 44 onwards, that that is from the news of the unseen, which we reveal to you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him. And you were not with them when they cast their pens as to which one will be responsible for Mary, nor were you with them when they disputed. So in other words, now Allah is going back and he's explaining that when Maryam salam, it was decided that she's a girl, but she will be allowed to go and, uh, you know, be near the Solomon's temple and be taught Islam. The problem then became, okay, fine, who will be her guardian? Who will be there, who will teach her deen and who will constantly be there to groom her and look after her? Mm -hmm. And so something that was very common in, uh, in that time period was that if you had to decide, you, you would cast lots or cast pens. It's kind of similar like, um, you know, when you, you write everyone's name on a small piece of paper, then you have to pick up one piece of paper, right? And whosoever name comes out, that person yeah, is selected. Yeah, the straw is like, oh, whichever the, one is right, the straw. Right, the straw and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, and sometimes they had this thing where you, there was um, uh, a certain target and you have to throw your arrow and whosoever arrow is closest, that is the person who will be decided. They had their own way of doing that's it. That's going through a lot of just right? to teach. Right, one, so so two. this this is uh, one of the things that they did. And Zakaria alayhi salam was chosen, of course, because that is what Allah wanted. And again, um, Muhammad peace be upon him is saying, you were not there when this happened. So we are teaching you all of these things because it's coming from us. And Muhammad peace be upon him is saying these words to the Christian delegation who is listening. So mm -hmm. he's saying, this, that is from the news of the unseen which we reveal to you. You were not with them when they cast their pens. 
Okay, so the Christian delegation is listening that yes, this man, how could he know all these things? Because all of this is mentioned in our Bible, that this is how Zachariah was chosen. And our Bible, of course, is in Hebrew language. This man does not know Hebrew language. How does he have all this information? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Allah says, and mention when the angel said, Oh, Maryam, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him, of a word from him. Whose name will be a uh, Messiah, Jesus, Isa, the son of Maryam, distinguished in this world and the hereafter, and among those brought near to Allah. So they're, they're giving him good news. And if you think about it, it says good news of a word. He does not say Allah's giving you good news of a son. Yeah, you look very confused. What, what's going on? Uh, I'm confused on who was a prophet at this time and who wasn't a prophet. Zakri alayhi salam is a prophet. Yeah. He has already given, his wife has given birth to Yahya alayhi salam. So now Yahya alayhi salam has also become a prophet. No, no. Before that, uh, when Hazrat Zakri alayhi salam was chosen, uh, you know, to teach Hazrat um, Maryam yeah, so, alayhi salam. So the prophet uh, is so, Zakriya. Yeah. Uh, if the prophet was Zakriya, then why was it that they had to go through this, uh, you know, no, a uh, deciding factor that who is going to teach. Right, but he, uh, even though he's a prophet, this is a, a custom that they did at that time, that there are so many imams. Yes, he's a prophet. Oh, was he a Rasul or a Nabi? <laughs> he was a Nabi. And the interesting thing is that this is what they would do at that time, because don't forget, the only child who is being taught, it's not like Maryam alayhi salam is the only child who is being taught. There are many boys in Solomon's temple mm -hmm. who are also being taught. And each one needs an imam. He needs a guardian who will look after that child, raise that child, groom that child, right? Uh, that, that guardian has to basically upbring that child. Now, the prophet cannot do it for every single person because mm -hmm. there's so many kids over there. So for each person, this is how, uh, you know, the boys would go to Solomon's temple. And then you simply become a guardian. Mm -hmm. But now there's a girl. So the question is, okay, well, we've never done this before. So who's going to look after her? And so the fair way, instead of saying, oh, it has to be Zakaria because he's a prophet or because he's the uncle, the fair way uh, of doing it is less, let us cast lots or cast pens, which means whoever is decided, this has to be someone decided by God. It has to be a, a decision coming from the divine. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's why when they did it, it was decided that it would be Zakaria alayhi salam. Oh, one last question yeah. uh, in this verse uh, that you just said was that of uh, Angel Jibreel or some angel came down to uh, Maryam Yeah, I'm, I'm, hold on. I'm, uh, let, uh, let, let me first explain Maryam that. No, let me first explain that. That what's yeah. happening over here is that uh, Allah is saying that Maryam, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word. So not good tidings or congratulations of a son from him. If it said that a, a son is coming from God, then you might be able to say, oh, then this is a son of God. But Allah is saying he's giving you good tidings of a word. Kun. Kun fayakun. He's giving you good tidings of a word. So Allah is simply going to say kun and you will conceive and you will become pregnant and you will give birth to this baby and the whole thing is going to be a miracle. So that's one beautiful thing you have to note over here. Secondly, the angel, now it's believed that the angel came in the form of a man. So the angel came, and this will be explained later on in, uh, in the Quran. It's not the first time the story is going to come. Every time it comes, Allah will give you more detail. So when the angel came, when the man came, of course, Maryam got scared because she had not seen, a, a, no man was allowed to enter except Zakaria salam. So then the angel told her, told her that, don't worry, I'm an angel, and I've come to give you this good news. That Allah has selected you. There's a special word. In other words, kun fayakun. You are about to have a. You will have a child, and he will be the Messiah. He is not just going to be any prophet. He is not just going to be any Rasul. He is going to be a Messiah, distinguished in this world, and he will speak to the people as a baby and in maturity when he's mm -hmm. mature, and he will be of the righteous. Now we know that, that Isa alayhi salam spoke as a baby. We know that he spoke as a child and he started to give the bleak and preach uh, when he was as young as 10 years old. Okay? Mm -hmm. But we but the fact that this is what, what our scholars say, because Allah says he will speak as a baby and when he's mature. Now why say that he'll speak to you when he's a baby or and he will speak to you when he's mature? Because when... If he's speaking to you as a baby, of course he will speak to you when he gets older as well, right? Uh-huh. 
So why specially mention as a baby and when he's mature? Um, uh, well, I think it could be like two reasons. One, when he's mature, he'll have you know more knowledge about Islam. But that's obvious. Come on. Or or or, or, <laughs> or maybe it is it's signaling that. Uh, that he will be raised and then when he comes back, yes. he will speak to you again right. in the future. This is the indication that he'll be raised, but he's going to come back. Because Allah's promised that he will speak to you, he will spread deen even when he's mature. So he's going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to come back during the time of Dajjal. Right? He is going to he's going to have a war with him, he's going to defeat the Jal, and it's during that time that he is going to exterminate every Jew in the world at that time. Because it was the uh, Jews only Jews or no Christians? No. It was the Jews who denied Isa al salam. Mm -hmm. It was the Jews who denied the, the promised Messiah, right? Now when when you have um believers when you have followers who deny a rasul right something has to happen at the end like like, it, the, like an azab like an azab so when you look at all the previous nations which we will discuss later who the less salam swali alayhi salam lut alayhi salam these were all what nation uh nation i don't know Hud alayhi salam lut alayhi salam oh, swali alayhi salam they, they, they were, were what rasuls. they were rasuls or nabis Rasuls. They were all Rasuls because they all came to their nation and they said, follow me, I have been appointed. Right? So they all were Rasuls. And when the, the time period was over, whoever listened to the Rasul was saved and whoever didn't was destroyed. destroyed. Now he, Isa alayhi salam, he's a Rasul. He has been sent to a nation and he has been sent to which nation? Any guesses? Bani Israel. Bani, Israel, Bani Israel. He was sent to Bani Israel to tell Bani Israel that you guys have messed up. We need, I, I, I am going to reteach the, the deen of God. And he was a Messiah. So Messiah actually means king. In other words, it was his job not just to be a Rasul, but to reinstate the kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. Because the Jews at this time were under the Romans. And the Romans were people who were, uh, who were worshipping idols. So um, the Bani Israel, who was supposed to be an ummat, that was supposed to be going around and spreading Islam, not only had they distorted the message, but they were under, they were, uh, uh, under the control of the Romans. So Isa was, uh, he was a Rasul, but he was also a promised Messiah. He was supposed to come as a king. He was supposed to uh, reteach the deen and reinstate the power of the ummat reinstate the kingdom of Israel. He was supposed to free the Jews from the Romans and give back power to the kingdom of Israel. Oh, 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 but that didn't happen. But that didn't happen because the Jews ended up going against him. They, um, they collaborated with the Romans and they wanted him to be killed. Allah therefore raised Isa salam, but his job isn't done, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he has to come back. So when he comes back, he has to come back and he has to reinstate the kingdom of Islam. At that time, Islam was with the Jews. They were the Muslims. But when he comes back, he has to reinstate the kingdom. He has to reinstate Islam. And those people who denied their Rasul, are they not supposed to get an Azab? So at that time, the Azab is going to come upon the Jews and it's going to come through the hands of the very Messiah whom they denied. And then in verse um, 47, Allah says, She said, uh, my Lord, how will I have a child when no man has touched me? So I'm not even married. The angel said, such as Allah, he creates what he wills. When he decrees a matter, he only says, kun fayakun, and it is done. So this is going to be a, an absolute miracle. Now, this is one of the things that were being raised that, okay, if Isa alayhi salam's birth is such a miracle, and that's why the Christians got confused and they said, okay, Jesus must be the son of God or he must be God. Then Yahya salam's birth was also a, a complete miracle, as we have just seen. Adam salam's birth is even a greater miracle because he didn't have a mother or a father. So why isn't he called the son of God or, well, you know, why isn't he called God? Right? So all of these things point out the fact that Christians have made all these stories that just don't make sense. And then the final three verses... Allah says, and he will teach him um, writing and wisdom and the Torah and the Injil. So this boy, Isa alayhi salam, 
Allah is telling Ad- Maryam السلام, that he will be a Messiah. And when Isa السلام, was in fact born, Allah was the one who taught Isa the Torah and he was taught Injil. He was given his own book called the Gospels. But the Torah is uh, distorted. Right. So that's why Isa السلام, came to clear all the distortions, right? Oh, but how was he taught Torah? If you uh, Allah through Jibreel السلام, right hello <laughs> taught him the correct version and make him a messenger we will make him a messenger to the children of Israel who will say indeed I have come to you with a sign from your Lord in that I designed for you from clay something that uh, the, the form of a bird then I breathe into it and it becomes a bird by the permission of Allah I cure the blind and and those who are uh, the lepers and I give life to the dead by permission of Allah so he keeps saying by permission of Allah by permission of Allah I'm not doing this because I'm God no yeah and I inform you of what you eat and what you store in your houses so I have all kinds of knowledge by the permission of Allah of course indeed and that is a sign for you if you are believers and I have come confirming what was before me of the Torah and to make lawful for you some of what was forbidden and I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. Here's the interesting thing. Isa salam also made slight changes to the Sharia. It was not just Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Isa salam is saying over here that he made slight changes. He made things lawful which were previously forbidden. And the Jews had an issue over here that why is he making changes to the laws of Moses? And on top of that, how is he performing all of these amazing things? So maybe he's possessed by a demon. But what we will subsequently see is that the rabbis understood he's a promised Messiah. He's showing us all of these signs to let us know I am the promised Messiah. The Messiah promised you in your books. It's me. I've come now. I've come to reinstate the kingdom of Israel. I've come to free you from the Romans. But their issue with him was that he uh, cursed uh, the, the priests and the rabbis. He cursed them because they had made so much changes to the books. And the fact that the rabbis had assumed a lot of power for themselves. So they knew that if we believe in this man as a promised Messiah, the first thing he's going to do is he'll take away our power. People will, you know, he will make us equal to the other Jews. And the rabbis had assumed a lot of uh, power for themselves. You will see the same things happen with, uh, unfortunately, some Muslims um, in our ummah. There are some imams who um, assume a huge amount of power for themselves. If you tell them that what you're doing is wrong, they get very upset. And when they, assume, when they get a lot of powerful positions, they start to misuse their power. You can see that in our ummah happening as well. There are some cases where this has happened, right? And that is why the, the beautiful thing is we have other scholars who instantly jump in and they are able to point out that what this man is saying is wrong. So it doesn't matter what his power is, it doesn't matter what his position is, it's wrong, right? Yeah. At that time, the Jews didn't have that. So if a rabbi was, say, was saying something wrong, the other rabbis would just be quiet and the Jews would be confused. They would say, okay, fine, if the rabbi is saying it, it has to be right. So the rabbis would uh, know the truth. but they would say Rabbis that. knew the truth, but they remained quiet. And they convinced all the other Jews that, no, no, this man, is he's just lying. Now, of course, the Jews could have used their own mind because that's why Isa alayhi salam was showing the signs and the miracles in the first place, right? So we'll stop over here, inshallah, and continue on with verse 51 in the next lecture. Assalamu alaikum.